the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Woodenhager. I'm the executive director here. And, uh, you know, we're so pleased to have, this is the third time we've met here at the garden about this project. And each time's more exciting. Uh, uh, I think it was probably four years ago. We had like that, like four years ago, um, that we had our uh, first meeting here. And it was still in the idea stage. And we were still just kicking off about what we were thinking about doing. Um, and now uh, we've come full circle and have really completed the project, and we really want to share that with you today. But when we talk about it being completed, I hope that this is actually, in some ways, also just a beginning. Uh, because uh, this project is going to be something that we think will have a life uh, going forward. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is not just this great product that we've created, but also how we can all use it and continue to add to it over time. So uh, with that, welcome here to the Botanic Garden. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ron Gallo, who, at the Santa Barbara Foundation, was the major brainchild behind this. So, Ron, thank you very much. Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm now at a stage of my life where I don't say, I don't need a mic. Mm -hmm. I can just protect because I know there are people who need amplification. I'm getting close to being one of them myself. I'm, I want to thank Steve for hosting us. And the last thing I am personally is the brainchild behind that. That will be the next speaker um, who I will introduce in a while. But I wanted to start actually uh, in the few minutes that I have with the new mission of the Santa Barbara Foundation because it so relates to this project. And that is to mobilize community wisdom and philanthropic capital to build empathetic, inclusive, and resilient communities. And that'll be our kind of guidepost for the next uh, bit of time, hopefully a long time. But that last word was resilient. And resiliency, when it comes to community, uh, has to do with rooting out barriers to trust. Uh, it has to do with working vigorously to make sure that all our residents have access to education and health and safety and housing and opportunity. But it's also about understanding, honoring, and working intelligently with our habitat. And this project in particular focuses on that, but really all of those things. At the essence, this was a project about finding community values. And I'll tell you, I don't have to tell you, that is really hard work. It's arduous, there are no shortcuts. It starts with really powerful conversations that began in this building and have extended out through the county. It's about listening carefully to very divergent points of view and being flexible and in a, staying in a place of discovery so that uh, you can get uh, to consensus. And it's also about honoring and respecting data. Uh, one of the things that has been one of my pet peeves throughout my entire career, whether you're talking about children or any social issue, environment, is everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a different vocabulary. Everyone has different meanings for different words and how they approach it. And what the conservation blueprint is really doing uh, is, and I like that Steve said, this is a launch. This is not the end of a project, is to give us that uh, common vocabulary, to give us common data so that whether you are interested in the future of ag, in the future of our connectivity to our landscape, or vibrant cities, these all have to be part of our resilient uh, nature of Santa Barbara County. And we now have an ally in this uh, wonderful tool. And I'm just very proud on behalf of the community that we were able to get uh, to this point. Uh, and I think it's going to really serve us well going forward. So with that said, I'd like to uh, bring up the brainchild. <laughs> um, uh, Sharon Main, you, you know that uh, she's also uh, been behind the Food Action Plan, which is uh, a big part of, of this kind of uh, approach, also using data. But she's always looking toward how we can bring the community together to solve problems. And she's been just a tremendous asset to the foundation and to this community. So I'd like to bring her up now to kind of go into more depth.
so much and thank you Steve for clearing the skies for us. A beautiful day at the garden as usual. Uh, we are here to celebrate uh, the completion of the Santa Barbara County Conservation Blueprint uh, and uh, thank you for, for joining us in this celebration. Culmination uh, in the, of the hard work and there's some planning work before but the hard work of over two years of design, research, data collection, public input which is interviews and focus groups and surveys. Um, because we wanted to create a single source of credible science-based information on the land and the resources in the county that anyone could use. And so this is a, you can layer this data, you can tell different stories, you can address different questions, um, and it's available to anyone for a broad range of uses and purposes. So uh, the Santa Barbara Foundation is one of the project partners along with the Land Trust for Santa Barbara County, and Chet Work is here, I'll introduce him in a moment, as well as um, Anna Olson from the Kachuma Resource Conservation District. And um, so I wanted to tell you, and I think this is no surprise to anyone in this room, there are really two things that are top of mind, and we found this throughout our process, which is we all are, are feeling that our open space and ag and ranch lands are under increasing pressure uh, for development and fragmentation. And we also, on the other side of the coin, recognize that people from here who've lived here a long time, who were born and raised here, are actually struggling to continue to live here because of the cost of housing and the cost of land. So how do we reconcile the, these two really different pressures, but important ones, important values to, to all of us? So the conservation blueprint, the report, um, is really a dynamic starting place for us to really be, to begin these conversations around these really challenging issues, as Ron mentioned. Um, you know, what do we preserve? Where do we develop? Who has access? Who doesn't? Who has, what are our common values and our beliefs? What are our misunderstandings that we need to clear up? And what are the tension points? These are really big issues, and it takes a really big project. I would probably, there we go. I first want to start by recognizing that an endeavor of this size and scale uh, takes donors with deep <coughs> understanding of the region and with really big vision to understand that a project like this is worthy of investment, even though it took many years to get here, um, they saw the vision, they saw the potential, and they knew it would be transformative. So we've got some, of, of course, the Santa Barbara Foundation, we kind of fell off the screen a little bit there, but uh, we have some really important fund holders, um, uh, local foundations, and I do want to recognize um, a few of those folks that are in the room today. Rachel Couch from the California Coastal Conservancy is here, and I just want to thank Rachel. A really great supporter from the very beginning, and recognizing that this has, is a great, powerful tool. We also have John Clark from the James S. Bauer Foundation. John, and in particular, has great uh, interest and love in conservation and has one who was our early supporters of this. So I want to acknowledge those and thank those folks. So um, we have a great team, and this is a, a little hard to see because I'm kind of fuzzed out in that tree there, but I want to talk, <laughs> talk about our team just really briefly here. Um, so I, as I think it was mentioned that I was the brainchild of this, but I really wasn't, um, Greg Parker, who is here, he is a trustee for the Land Trust and also on our executive team. Um, of the project. Greg came to me at one point and said, you know, the Land Trust is looking for this data for us to create our own strategic plan so that we can actually be smarter in our conservation. And um, as we started talking, and we actually doodled this on the back of the napkin, um, we realized this was much bigger than just what the Land Trust was trying to do, and it really needed to be out in the community. And so that's when we pulled in the community of the Kachima Resource Conservation District, and LEAF also became a partner in the project. Each of us still maintaining our own goals with this, but now really working as a tool that can be applied more broadly, whether it be social, environmental, oh, business, yeah. housing, energy, agriculture, whatever that Thank may you. be. So we formed a steering committee, and um, we have a few of those folks in the room here today. We wanted really to get the, a broader perspective and make sure that it was a useful tool for many more in our community. It's made up of very passionate people that we've had a great time working with. Um, and they represent conservation, resource management, ranching, agriculture, academia, really to give us this breadth that we needed. And it really, like I said, it's been a pleasure. We're going to hear from a couple of those folks today, Paul Van Leer, um, and we're also going to hear from Steve Windhager, who's, as you saw, heard from a little bit earlier. But I want to recognize Kim Kimball is here as well. He was also on our steering committee, and thank you, Kim, for your work on this project. Really 
important to our steering committee is that this was uh, to be a tool that would not be a, a, a harmful or take away from conservation efforts or from landowners. So we were careful to build in safeguards, and we can talk a little bit about that at the end. But we also wanted this to not be prescriptive. We didn't want to come up with a plan for the community. We wanted this to be de descriptive of what this region is, so that to, regardless of what your project is or your passion or what you want to do with the data, it would be useful to anyone. So whether you were in conservation or, or you were in ag or education, or whether you were in housing and development, or if you're looking at equity issues, maybe um, climate justice or social justice, this tool we wanted to be useful to everyone. So that's um, this picture here. I just want to point out we're on um, Las Suarez Ranch. Um, uh, Paul hosted us that day. Uh, in our trust building with our community, this is why these processes take so long. Uh, we toured the various ranches. We had meetings in barns. We got to hear the perspective of the landowner and the and the and the rangeland owner managers, so that we could understand their needs and their um, their concerns. So anyway, it was a great learning experience and a great uh, community building process. So before I turn it over to Chet, um, I do want to um, uh, just quickly also recognize we have a, a few dignitaries in the room that I want to thank you for coming. Supervisor Joan Hartman, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Kathy Murillo from the City of Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. Mayor Eric Freeman, City Council, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have a representation from Das Williams' office as well. And Galita. And Galita, City of Galita, yes, great. Those folks want to bring their Oh, great. <laughs> Welcome, thank you. Great, well, thank you guys for, for showing up. And so, in conclusion, I just wanted to point out that, um, again, before I turn it to Chet to go, to go into more detail, um, we really were finding some common values across all sides of the spectrum here. Um, and I wanted to put these primary things up that, that really came through for us, that there is a recognition that, and value for ecosystem services. What the agricultural and open spaces really provide all of us as a, as a community, a land that filter water, um, uh, uh, soils that uptake carbon from the environment. Um, you know, these are all things that, that benefit all of us. Um, and that there is really an importance of landscape connectivity for the integrity of both land and agricultural operations. That understanding that we need to not fragment these habitats and these, these um, operations in order for them to be vibrant and successful. Mm. That there is a multiple benefit mindset that we recognize that the future of conservation is also looking at what's going to benefit people, habitat and environment, as well as um, our, our, e our economy. So it's really looking at a number of options. And a good example might be releasing water for a dam for downstream users, and it also benefits steelhead in the, in the streams, and it provides groundwater recharge. So looking at those opportunities for multiple benefits. And then finally, I think most importantly, is there's a strong community commitment here in this region to conserve our landscapes and agriculture. But I think more importantly, I think we're ready now to find solutions as a whole, on a landscape scale, and no longer as an, a, in the NIMBY uh, realm, that we are, have a genuine mm -hmm. commitment to wanting to see long-term viability of, of, uh, and the integrity of our working and natural lands. I think we may be ready to talk about density, and we may be ready to talk about what agriculture needs to be flexible and viable in the future. And I, I, I'm glad we're here to start that conversation. So I'd like to now turn it over to Chet Ork, who's going to go through some details of the plan. executive director for your land trust here in town and, and for those of you who don't know the land trust just very briefly we have a mission to conserve important natural resources agricultural lands scenery recreation throughout the county we work with willing landowners we've been around for 30 years and have protected just over 27,000 acres with about 50 families here in this community and we're very proud of those relationships 
this has been an important project for us, and um, and it's been a very large project. And I've got now eight and a half more minutes to try and tell you all what we've done. <laughs> <laughs> I was kayaking with my kids in the harbor a few weekends ago, and I saw those black skimmers that love to hang out on the on the beach. And uh, and I think that's what we're going to do today. Is is we're going to skim just a narrow line in an ocean worth of information that we've pieced together. But hopefully I can give you all a little sense of, of what you might find when you look at this blueprint document. The first thing I would say is it's two things. It's a written document that depicts the community values and a lot of the information that we glean from our expert interviews. And it's an online data repository that we call the Atlas. And that's a compendium of local uh, geospatial information, maps, uh, about what occurs on the land and what is the landform in our county. And I'll talk about those somewhat separately, but at the very beginning we realized that in order to document everything in this county, you'd actually need a room about this size full of these many books. And so the blueprint in itself is not a compendium of inf information, it's an introduction and a help for the community to understand the, the questions, the concerns, the conversations that need to happen in order for us to uh, live here in Santa Barbara County for, for the next millennia. Let's, let's be optimistic. Um, recognizing all that detail, we started very early with, with a classification, with an idea of how to organize it. And, and I've left this slide up because you can see our thematic chapters across the bottom. We organized all of our data, all of our comments under the, under the uh, headings of water resources, uh, flora and fauna, ag and ranch lands, and community in the land. And for those of you who've been part of this process, you'll recognize there's a fifth one that's missing there. We, we looked at all these through the lens of a shift in climate, and uh, what we realized was that those climate changes are going to have an impact on all four of these themes. And you'll find in the written document that that climate is a separate portion of every chapter. You'll find on our digital atlas that there's a, that there's a separate section um, to talk about climate. I guess what I would say is, don't read the slide, but recognize that we collected an incredible amount of data and we really worked hard to try and present that data in new ways that you probably hadn't seen before. So you'll see very colorful, very compelling <coughs> graphs that we felt the public would really benefit from understanding in this community. Those are from water. Uh, we talk a lot about flexibility of agriculture and how it shifted over time. I love this graph, which, which basically suggests that 120, 130,000 acres have always been in production in this county. Where are they? What are they being used for? That's what's shifted over time. Understanding these conversations about how agriculture works. We've brought a lot of graphs, a lot of images <coughs> for you to understand the story that we're trying to tell. Uh, also in the, in the blueprint document, when you get a chance to read it, you'll recognize that we didn't, we didn't shy away from conflict. We wanted to recognize that in our interviews with the community, with the experts, that we got conflicting opinions about the importance of resources. We didn't want to decide which opinion was right, but we certainly didn't want to fail to depict it. So in every chapter in the blueprint, you're going to see two or three pages dedicated to introducing the community to some of these ongoing dialogues, places where the community needs to continue to have discussion. And I would say, as Sharon mentioned, she can distill the, the conclusions that we got down to four points. At the end of every chapter, we really tried to highlight the conclusions that we've written uh, about. It's a 150-page document or so. It's really difficult to talk about it in now four and a half minutes that I have left. <laughs> but what I would also say is that the end notes, it's funny that, that someone would ever highlight the footnotes or the bibliography of a document. But that's where, if you want to go deep on the topic of agriculture, because you've been an environmentalist all your life, or you'd really like to learn more about water, read the end notes. Find those resources. Those are the expert opinions that we had the opportunity to interview, to engage with, that will tell you more and more and more, and fill your brains with a room like this full of knowledge about this county. That's an important place when you want to dive a little bit deeper than the blueprint takes you. The other half of the blueprint is the digital atlas, and uh, this is just a picture that I took of the, uh, of the front page of that website and the materials that you'll take away today. Uh, you'll have ways to link. I assure you I'm not doing that. Is that my cell phone? It's not my cell phone. requesting help. Already, they want help. I'm going to go low tech, but I have a voice for that. Um, I would say you can.
can see the explore by theme here as well. You see water, climate, ag, uh, flora, and fauna. The same ability to explore the data that we put together. You can also explore by the watersheds. Uh, the organization, Conservation Biology Institute, I think it's actually the clicker. Sorry about this. Just turn it off. Thank you. Uh, Conservation Biology Institute and, and John Gallo, who's here today, have done an amazing amount of work to piece this together on behalf of the community, and I think this is a great tool to share with you, and I encourage you to go and use and learn about the data that's here. I can't show you the 350 publicly available data layers that we compiled and oriented so that they could be all layered on top of each other. We're not going to go through that. But I thought I'd give you some idea of what you might get out of it. And I have a couple maps that I'd like to show you. And we're not inside the viewer because uh, it never works with PowerPoint as well as I would like. But imagine you're a developer in this county and you want to understand where to develop, what should be developed. Would it not be useful to see what it used to look like? Can we track the change in our urban footprint over 50 years if we toggle back and forth? Is this an interesting uh, viewpoint that somebody might benefit from? If you're a farmer or a rancher in this county, would it not benefit you to understand future predictions about precipitation? Hmm. Would it not be disappointing to us all that these and despite the color on here, all of them represent less precipitation. <laughs> but obviously the highlands of the, of the, of the mountains are, are those that are going to be least affected as precipitation shifts in this county. What if you wanted to know the fire history of this landscape? Obviously it's very much on our minds, and as we built this tool, we thought it'd be best to depict them in 25-year tranches here. You can see the darkest green representing the most recent ones, but of course, uh, when you take two years to do a project, fires break out across the county. Look where last year's fires landed on this landscape. Yeah. We can use these tools to tell us where are the most places that are at greatest risk for fire. Uh, an interesting conversation this community now has easy access to the data. What if you wanted to know what crops were planted where? Most of these purples represent wine grapes that have gone in 70,000 acres over the last 30 years. Where was agriculture in the past? Where is it now? What's being grown where? What kind of pesticides are being used? Where are they in relationship to our groundwater? What if you're a rancher that wants to understand the grazing potential of a new property that you're buying? This will give you some assessment uh, ability to look through uh, on precipitation, temperature change, slope, aspect, all these informing uh, abilities uh, that you might have. This is a map that we put together on groundwater recharge potential, overlapping where groundwater is with the geology underneath it. I had an interesting conversation uh, with some folks recently that didn't understand the power of geospatial tools until the tragedies that we had in this county. <coughs> and they said it was great. I got to see Google Earth with a boundary drawn on it. And that boundary may have been the flooding or it may have been the fire boundary. <coughs> This takes that concept of looking at your county from above and not just adding the flood data, not just adding the perimeter of the fire, but look how much other data is there that we now have the ability to utilize and to uh, use in our conversations. Again, the purpose of this is not to depict something of, of controversy. It's to provide information for the conversations that come forward. The land trust is eager, eager to utilize this data to design our own strategic direction. What properties, what landowners do we want to add to those 50 that we've worked with so far over the next 20 years? And we think this gives us a great amount of information to do so. The community input that we gathered in the conservation blueprint will help inform that as well. Lastly, one of my favorite maps. We have all this amazing protected land in the Los Padres National Forest in Vandenberg Air Force Base. But for me, I'm a wildlife guy. How are we going to move critters across this landscape in the future? And we use the blueprint to somewhat tell us where the best habitat is, where are the most likely habitat corridors that could move some of those species safely across this landscape. These sort of data points we think will be valuable for us, but we're so excited to see how you all might make uh, and lastly, one of the things that I think my, my board of trustees is most excited about is a recreation component. The Land Trust has done a lot to preserve trails in the South County, but we looked at the trails and we looked at them against population density, and what we recognized was that the cities of 
Santa Maria and Orchid, though similar in population to the South County, mm -hmm. have about a 20th of the number of trails. I think eight miles of trails, um, uh, excuse me, a 40th, uh, are all that you find in the North County for a population density as great as the South County. I know there's a lot of people in Goleta that want more trails. Uh, and, and that obviously shows up on this as well. But if you look at where the population is that has no access to recreation, it's certainly in the North County. These kind of visualizations are helping inform the decisions that we make. So I am going to leave this for later, but I need to um, uh, introduce Anna Olson. And for most of you uh, who were three years ago here, or two years ago here, we had a different uh, Anne uh, <laughs> as part of the Consumer Resource Conservation District, and that was Anne Coates. And, and we were very sorry to lose her as part of this project. She was here at the beginning. Uh, Anne Olson came on about a year and a half ago, I believe, and um, has been an incredible <laughs> asset. We didn't even miss a step. And so uh, Anne Olson with the third partner from the project, the Consumer Resource Conservation District. Um, I'm, I'm very excited 
that I get the opportunity to present our, uh, to introduce a couple of our steering committee members and be able to tell some of the stories um, about our blueprint and some of them are featured in the blueprint and, and some of them will help us move forward into how we can use it. So first I'm gonna introduce Paul Van Leer as he, he was mentioned before. Um, he is a steering committee member. Uh, he is of course a farmer and rancher and the ranch manager from Las Veras Ranch. Um, his perspective on the relationship of agriculture and conservation is an excellent example of how understanding common values can help us find common ground. Thanks, Anna, and thank you all for coming. So first off, I want to thank the project team. I know Dustin's here, thank you, and uh, Brookings is not, but without them, this thing wouldn't happen. The mapping system that they developed with the overlays, unbelievable. I'm still amazed every time I see it. I also want to thank my fellow committee members. Um, with their insight and their hard work, I don't think we could have got where we're getting as well. So, so why is it important for the community to better understand agriculture? I think knowledge is power. A lot of conflict could be avoided if everyone understood the other's perspective. I take every opportunity to try to educate people regarding ranching and farming operations. Sometimes what is viewed as open space or a view corridor is actually our backyards where we work and live. One of the things the blueprint brought to the conversation is that agriculture lands are dynamic, not static landscapes. They're every, ever evolving and diversification is paramount for their future. Bible lag and the preservation of agriculture is one of the best ways you can use to conserve land. So what are some of the possible uses for this, like for ranching and farming? I can just, there's one example. Let's say you want to expand your operation and you are, or trying to lease some ground that you're not familiar with. Well, you can go to this atlas that was developed and you can use the overlays to check soil types, slope stability, slopes, maybe repairing habitat that you have to avoid. So it's like a pre-check prior to you going out there and actually viewing what's going on. And I can see that as a huge benefit. And once you actually do your site visit, once you actually do your testing, then you can go back to that. If you see something out there you're not quite sure is adequate, or you're not sure what it is, utilize the atlas to come back and save yourself a lot of time. It's a one-stop shop. So overall, I think, is an amazing resource of information. It's a one-stop shop, like I said before, for both the public and agriculture. I hope everyone gets an opportunity to utilize it. Thank you. the Atlas is the evolving project that we all continue to use for the coming decades. And we continue to add to it because we can continue to add layers over time. Um, the, the garden's looking at how we use this, uh, not just to think about corridors and agricultural partners. One of the projects we've got actually is working with uh, agricultural partners to put in native plant hedgerows in agricultural fields to promote native pollinators rather than having move around bees that both improve <coughs> crop production but also uh, improve uh, wildlife habitat. So how do we have those win-win things? And I think the Atlas is one of the, the, the booklet is one of those things that it identifies those opportunities for partnership between uh, folks that might not have always realized that we were a natural partner between the agriculture and conservation. Um, <laughs> Paul's one of the guys that's hosting some of our, our, uh, uh, our uh, hedgerows on his project. I mean, so uh, Paul's known that he's been a, a, a partner for conservation. I don't think the conservation community has always realized it as well. And so I think this is the kind of partnership that begins the dialogue, that begins to get us thinking about novel ways to achieve all of our shared goals that go beyond where any of us are. 
As we look at the Atlas, what I'm really excited about is the way to really get information out there so we can make better choices in the future. It is a powerful mapping tool that we can continue to add to. We're working on areas of the Zaka, back, uh, Zaka fire in the backcountry that have never been mapped before botanically. So as we begin to understand what the habitat types are out there, we can feed some of that information, the non-rare species, into the, uh, these maps so we have a better understanding for how habitat might be connected into the backcountry and have that come into the front country. Because the truth is, we don't want to think about nature only being out there in the Los Padres forest lands. We want to bring it into our communities and into our uh, towns so that our trails can be corridors not just for us, but also corridors for lots of wildlife. And so that's what it's going to take is to think about Santa Barbara in the long range future. How do we continue to have more people come to our lovely community? How do we allow folks to stay in our community that have been here for generations? How do we enable that and also still preserve those values, both agricultural and conservation and wildlife, that we've come to really value about the Central Coast? Um, how do we do that? How do we have our cake and eat it too? Well, the Atlas is going to be one of those tools that we can use to help us do that. I want to make sure everybody knows that we're, Dustin has the Atlas set up in the back. Uh, on a computer, and so I encourage you all at the end of the, uh, this session to go and actually see it in action. Take it for a test drive. It's also online. It's really simple. But uh, if you want to see the expert use it, um, Dustin can do some really amazing things and can help you understand how just how powerful this tool is uh, as we think about the future. So uh, I, I don't know who I'm supposed to turn it back over. I'm going to I'm gonna turn it back over to Sharon. Okay, perfect. Take it off. All right, great. Um, so again, um, uh, we're going to open this up to questions um, and allow us to have some conversation for the next you know 10 or 15 minutes here and thank you Steve and, and all who mentioned our other project partners I I wanted to not lose the sight of how integral they've been to our project and so again John Gallo chief scientist from Conservation Biology Institute Dustin Pierce who not only was our project manager throughout but Dustin also um, was a, a huge contributor to the actual um, report and uh, was a, a great uh, asset for us in, in pulling that together. Um, and just so you know, um, Dustin is also available, as is John, uh, to really help you with technical assistance that may come up over the course of the next few months uh, and longer. We want to be able to, for people to understand it and know how to use it, and he can actually help walk you through and give you some ideas how to use it. So, it, so today, check it out, kind of get a brief preview. Again, everything is available online, sbcblueprint.net. Um, this is where you can download uh, and look at the full report, the 100 and some odd pages. Uh, you can look at the executive summary. You can take a tour and link right to the, the atlas where, where all that data is held. Uh, and you can keep updated on what's happening. We plan to have some workshops. We plan to have um, some uh, webinars and technical assistance available. So going there and, and signing up to say, I'd like to be involved, so that we can let you know when those are available. Because some people really are going to want the time to dig deeper. So, um, and then also um, sign up in the back um, with Dustin if you, if you know for sure you want to do workshops so we can start planning that. So I just want to give you a little bit of housekeeping on that. And so now I'd like to really open it up for questions to <coughs> our panelists, to any of us, of uh, what you would like to know more about, hear a little bit about, well, how can we clarify for you? Sure. So what is the mechanism for this being updated on a continuous basis? <coughs> Great. So how are we going to continue to update this project? And um, I, I'm going to have Chet talk a little bit about this, because you've talked about this, or either one of you, we've talked a little bit about how as people upload this data, it, that, it, that perpetuates that. So uh, I guess th it's a good question. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it speaks to the whole reason that we wanted to, to not only collect this data, but push it back to the community. And I think that community use is the way that this stays updated and real. I think if, if this were left to the Land Trust uh, or the Kachuma Resource Conservation District, as our strategic planning goes, whatever that is, every five years or more, we would have to go out and solicit that new data. But what we reflected is there's a big lift to get this data the first time, but the maintenance is a much smaller lift. So as your organization or any of the organizations in here uh, use this data for their own strategic planning and they find that the Fish and Wildlife Service that's here today, or, or the State uh, Wildlife Board, or the new vegetation layer has been updated, they'll bring that to the blueprint and it'll be available for the community. And you may only find a year from now that five of the 350 data layers need to be updated. That's a reasonable cost. If we waited five years, maybe 200 of them. 
need to go, whatever that number is. So I guess what I would say is the maintenance of this comes from the community embrace. And we think that as organizations engage in their own strategic planning, as they engage in using this item, as they find new data, as they even create new data, um, that as we bring that into the blueprint, it will, it will be maintained. And one of the reasons we chose the conservation biology's database and platform is because there are a lot of statewide projects that are going on. Uh, so they're constantly updating state layers on highways or state layers on, on different resources that, are, that, will, that will be integrated into this automatically um, because of their other projects that they're hosting on that site. Does that answer your question? Okay. And I, I will, I will, oh yes. I just want to add to that that uh, you can bring in uh, your private layers to add on to these maps and keep them private, or you can then share them with everybody else. So to the extent that you have a project that you want to layer in on top of this, this can be your GIS platform uh, in a lot of ways. But then you can also then take a layer that you want to get out to the public and you can share it with everybody else. And so those are the two strengths of these, uh, this project and that why it has the possibility to really be crowdfunded, crowd maintained. Now, of course, I think it's important that, that we do have a backbone that supports. There's some basic uh, 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 licensing and other things that we need to, to keep going. So, um, so we will look to a strategy that will help us maintain that, um, if not in perpetuity, certainly for a long enough until this becomes so robust and being used that we'll have the resources needed to keep it going. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Jen Krieger. I'm with Bay County of Santa Barbara Sustainability Division. And we have an existing energy and climate action plan that's going to be needing to be updated in the next couple of years. I'm just curious what data is already layered into the atlas, or maybe if there's interest in layering in data on carbon sequestration potential. Uh, that's a good question for John or Dustin. Yeah. My sense is that there is not a layer on carbon sequestration potential, but I think it could be easily acquired. And there's a lot of conversation around rangeland sequestration of carbon. Um, and I know that there have been some maps created auxiliary to the blueprint about where and how that might uh, occur. And that's exactly what we're talking about, about great data that can come from external sources. And of course, if you wanted the existing vegetation or uh, precipitation or climate expectations, they're already there, so you would integrate your data into those existing data layers. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that a, did I overspeak? Uh, no, I think that, that was a, a really good overview. Uh, Dustin's the one that knows the Atlas inside and out. He knows all the data layers, and, and uh, he lives here. He's a great resource for that question and, and can answer it, yeah, speak to it further. Um, but it, in a nutshell, you could, you could think of this as, as a really good foundation for any specific question you want to ask, and, and so yours is a great case study. We'll have 75% of the layers that you'll want are already there, and then you can bring in the additional ones and add, add the layers in and, and do analyses. And there's also something that we haven't really talked about much, which is the uh, analytical capabilities of this platform. There's ways that you can start combining layers if you want to start doing math and saying, you know, there's five different factors that we think are important here, and we want to overlay them and give them relative weights you can have a mechanism for doing that in a graphical user interface to see how all that looks. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of wealth potential. Uh, Dustin, did you want to speak to anything about the particulars of the... Yeah, we, we don't have a specific layer on carbon sequestration potential. Um, I'm just not aware of that being available right now, but if that's something like that the county's developing, then absolutely we would love to, to bring that into the, the platform that we have. Uh, some of the work that has been going on in terms of uh, carbon farming, as it's been called, some of that information is already within the Atlas. So that is available for viewing already. And anything you're wanting to look at in terms of like current or historical climate, as well as projected climate, we do already have within the Atlas. So I mean, like John was saying, you know, nearly 75% or more of the data you would want is gonna be in there. But um, those things about data gaps or what might be useful, that's really what we want to know moving forward so we can make sure this is broadly useful to everybody. And Jen, just so you know, we have done some initial studies for like compost on rangeland mm -hmm. and, and some studies on potentially looking forward um, with some outside grants looking at other potential. So we should be able to have access to that information. <coughs> so Jen, just to, to back off that um, legacy works here in the room, it's an actual mapping, some GIS mapping of um, compost effort into rangelands and we'll talk about how we pull that data into this. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Great. See, it's already starting great. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> a question back here. Hi, I'm Naomi Kovacs. I'm with Superman the Wolf's office. Um, I'm curious, how do you uh, ensure that any data coming from an external source or any updated data is from a reputable source, it's reputable quality data? Great. Yeah, and so we, that's why we had this um, great uh, team to really kind of vet that data. And so that, uh, and, I'll, and I can turn that question over to either Dustin or, or, or John in terms of uh, the process that goes through to make sure that that data fits within our system. So which of you would like to address that? Uh, do you want to take Dustin? it? Yeah, I can take, I mean, the existing data that we have come from authorities, you know, existing um, agencies, organizations that um, have been producing data on land use or data on um, roads or different boundary layers um, for a number of years now. So we know those are reputable sources. As we move forward and start getting them from different ancillary resources, it's going to have to be really a one-by-one -one approach to just ensure that that is quality data that we're looking at and actually represents the reality of what's on the ground in the county. There is a metadata layer uh, that yeah. explains where the data comes from. So you can decide for yourself also if yeah. you want to trust it or not. So it'll explain exactly where the data came from. You can decide, okay, do I trust the Forest Service or not? Well, but you, you, you can you know where it came from. I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying that you have the opportunity to know where the data came from so you can make up your mind. So I think, and that would certainly be as you go forward, you want to make sure there is that data layer that says, um, this is provided by uh, an amateur naturalist, or this was provided by someone from outside the county that has suspicious credentials. I don't know, but you know, you could have that information. I, I would just reiterate that we're not going to accept something that doesn't have at least a rigorous depiction of how it was created and where it came from. Uh, and what I love most about the blueprint and the atlas is, especially on the digital versions of this, and we didn't hand out the the one pound version of the blueprint. And, but, but in some ways that's actually great because the digital version has hyperlinks to all the maps, it has hyperlinks to all the references. And what CBI did a great job of is not only depicting where each data layer came from, but allowing you to simply click the button and go to where that data layer lives and the agency, the organization, the entity that created it and find it exactly yourself. Again, none of this was hidden data, it was just very hard to get it all together. And, and what we've done is compiled it for you, but we've, we've left the trail for you to follow if you want to go back to its source, whether that's the comments that we received in the blueprint or whether it's the actual data that's in the app. Question right here. Um, given the fact that obviously a lot of our watersheds and land, our creek channels in particular have changed pretty significantly in the wake of the, the debris flows, is there any plan to sort of remap those as they are now? Um, should I take that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the short answer is no, but the short answer is also it will happen. And um, I'm amazed uh, every day. Uh, you know, I, I went to graduate school, I think, at, at an interesting pivot point for geospatial knowledge, and it was very easy for me to see the value of this it's a, it's a visual tool, it's nothing more than that, but it's so compelling. And it was very easy for me to see how ubiquitous it would become in conservation planning. You'll see now that it's becoming ubiquitous in disaster planning and in the sighting of McDonald's and, and, and all these other things. Um, they flew uh, the disaster zone with, with, with drones or a plane within days of that. Uh, there's laser, um, what they call laser radar, LIDAR data that's sub-centimeter accuracy. That data will eventually be released to the public. We'll understand those floodplains much more carefully. And, and I would just say the biggest problem we're going to have at the Blueprint is where to house all the data that will eventually be created because some of these are going to be rather large files. And if we get our hands on them and they're important for the community, we're going to do our best to put them up to where the community can find them all in a collective area. So uh, my understanding is that data is coming. We've talked to the Flood Control <coughs> District and the Land Trust about that. My understanding is that FEMA is going to redraw boundaries. When those are redrawn, of course, we're going to upload that information and, and replace the, the, FEMA, uh, the floodplain information that's there. We want it to be as accurate as possible. And, uh, and with you all using it, you're going to make sure that it remains as accurate as possible. And Kira, I'd like to also address that, that I think that uh, it's important, so as these conversations these need to start happening, uh, where are our priority areas for 
you know, revegetating, for uh, rechannelizing, for um, uh, looking at re re uh, alignment of trails. This, the values part of it, I think, is really a great starting place because we've already gotten the community buy-in on a pretty broad scale, saying that these are important values to us. So I think it's a really important starting place, so that you're not starting from scratch kind of getting this kind of broad community understanding consensus. If we can start these kinds of conversations where, where we've left off here, and then use that data as ways of having the visual, visualization to really start to have those conversations, that's where we'd love to see that go. Because that just gives you that, that leg up of starting this really important conversation. Thank you. I just have one more comment to that. And, and Sharon and I this morning, I said, well, what's What's the best case scenario that we get to put this thing down and not think about the blueprint for a few <laughs> months, but if somebody says, uh, we want to use it and help us use it, or we already found flaws with it, and we want this fixed. And um, uh, as we've been working with John Gallo recently, you know, he's been telling us that some of the data layers we put in a year and a half ago need to be updated. <laughs> We're like, come on, it hasn't even rolled out yet. <laughs> I think we recognized from the very beginning that the data is flawed and that the data is, is always old and stale and it will constantly be. And so there's, there's a lift for us that we're going to need to understand. There are gaps in the data. And I think we saw opportunity there where we could say, OK, is there a researcher at UCSB? Is there a, a, a water quality nonprofit that's collecting <laughs> great data uh, that needs to be inserted into this gap? How do we get that? How do we fund that? How do we make sure that our community has that information that's going to be so valuable? And I would just say that's, you know, uh, that's, that's part of the, the, the marvel of this is that it's never going to be complete. It's never going to be perfect. But it's a whole lot better than the conversations we're having now, which are a lot of people talking past each other because they're not speaking from the same source of data. And, and I think that's where we see this going is, is building. So we're, uh, we're just a little past 11, and I want to get folks out of here. Um, so uh, maybe one more question, and then, uh, then we'll release you all. But we will be here to talk. Yes? Uh, uh, Stuart Kasman, City of Toledo. I was just curious about the level of aggregation that's publicly available. I can imagine that some landowners would have had concern about uh, privacy and you know some of these things they wouldn't want publicly available. So how specific is the data that's that's available? That's a great question, and, and I alluded to that. So thanks for bringing that up. So again, turn that over to our panel. But Paul, a little. Well, a little bit what on we did, too. what we tried to do is, you know, it's a mapping system. As you focus in at 100 acres, it goes out. So you, you can't focus in directly like you can Google Earth right down to the ground. So that's one way that we try to accomplish the you know, intimacy or privacy for the, the actual landowners. And that might be the case too for an endangered species. We don't want necessarily to have that data out where somebody could go right to exactly where it is. But to look at it um, in a, on a landscape scale, it gives us a better sense of where those species are in terms of corridors or connectivity. So using it from a landscape perspective. And then um, Chet, if you want to go a little bit deeper of how we can. I think our steering committee was always um, very hawkish about painting a, a target on a landowner's back. We didn't want that. We knew that a data source that did that wouldn't be broadly accepted, and we didn't want to create that. Some of the data layers that are in the blueprint have remarkable resolution, but the story of the blueprint is the aggregation of data. And so, as, as, as John Gallo alluded to, we've done some very simple analytics to try and give someone uh, some perspective of if you care about water, you might care about these areas. And we've aggregated eight or nine data layers together and, and sort of subjectively forced them together. It's in those aggregations where we're sort of saying this is an important area for water and this is a less important area for water, where we've, where we've, um, where we've used the, the 100 acre um, system uh, of, of basically obfuscating the detail. We didn't want to show someplace uh, smaller than 100 acres as having a big X on it. This should be protected or this should be unprotected. Um, and we didn't want to prescribe that. But some of the data layers do have the, their original level of accuracy, and you can zoom in, uh, but it just depends on the data. And uh, keep in mind that the data was all available. We just put it in a place where someone could find it easier. So this is not data that wasn't already uh, available to, to people to find. And you can find where we found it by following the trail that we left for you. Um, where do you want me to get on that? 